Thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Denver United. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Happy fall back day. The consolation for an hour less sunshine is an hour more sleep in the balance. I don't know that that's the worst deal, at least right now. Um, so thanks for being here and being the family of God. You know, this is November, it's Legacy Month, and the name Legacy refers to our annual Legacy Offering at the end of November each year, and we'll do that this year and tell you about it a little more each week as we approach. We give together. This isn't our normal worship giving. This is not our tithe or the normal offerings we bring. This is designed to be over and above as we're able and willing. It's a free will offering. There's no pressure. We're not going to arm twist you. We're not going to um, do any of the money games or anything like that. It's simply an opportunity each year for us to express generosity uh, as the starting point of the holiday season, the time that is the pinnacle of our Christian observance of generosity where God didn't withhold himself but gave his only son to us. And uh, that season, of course, in American culture has gotten hijacked by consumerism and is about um, a lot of other things. And so it's really powerful to begin with uh, generosity, with looking at ourselves, where we are, how God's blessed us, and then the world around us. The premise of the legacy offering is scripture's teaching in 2 Corinthians 9 that we should be able to be generous on every occasion. It's us collectively endowing us the cooperative enterprise that is our church family with the capability of being generous on every occasion. It gives us an above and beyond our budgeted normal giving fund that's designated largely to respond to needs and opportunities as they emerge, whether that's um, one country invading its smaller neighbor and displacing millions of people as refugees, whether that's hurricanes or tsunamis or other natural disasters that leave hundreds of thousands of people bereft and homeless, whether it's local needs, lost jobs, lost um, situations or circumstances that leave people without any more stops to pull out. It enables us every year to do what I believe ought to be the church's primary reputation, being generous, demonstrating love. Love isn't a concept, love is an action. And so the legacy offering is all about putting love into action. And that's why I love this time every year. I simply invite, we never pressure, and then the congregation every year astonishes me, you with your generosity. Sometimes we're in times that are lean and we have little to give. Sometimes we're in times that are abundant and we have a lot to give. Some of us are entrusted with resources in order to be givers as a part of our spiritual gifting. Others of us barely put food on the table. There's no judgment. There's no indication in this of our our commitment to Jesus, it's merely an opportunity for us together to be generous in the year ahead on every occasion. It's a beautiful expression of faith and of love, and I look forward to that together. That is, and so that'll happen at the end of November, and that is... Um, where this time of year in the series that we're beginning today draws its name. As we're creating a legacy for this little organization that is one tiny outpost in the middle of this city, in this time in history of the enduring enterprise of Jesus's church, which never falters, never fails. And Jesus promised, I will build it, right? We in this time have the opportunity to create a legacy, to live for something that's more than us, to be about something that transcends our circumstances for worse and for better. And so every year we look at a riff on that theme of what it means to live a, le a legacy. And this year, our focus is living on purpose, living toward and out of the purpose for which we are created what it means to live beyond day-to-day -day survival or year-to-year -year fulfillment, to live in a way that at the end of all things for us will have established a legacy where people say, you know, like great-grandpa Juan, man, he was the real thing. And our family turned 
in his time because of his faithfulness. Or man, Grandpa JD, the way he said yes to God, that established something that changed what it means to be our family. This is our invitation in Christ. I love the word we received this morning from our elder, Dave Cameron, that God is, as it were, dropping the gavel and saying once for all, case closed, you are not guilty. So we don't have to live out of the shame and that buried in a whole feeling. Instead, we can live into the identity that God has ascribed to us in Christ Jesus. That's what legacy is all about. Let's pray and then we'll jump in to our series this month, Father, in the name of Jesus. There are many things that are important and many things that ask for our attention. Right now, we choose to give our attention to your word. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts, attune our minds, form Jesus in us. This is our worship. Amen. My heroes are mostly freedom fighters. And there are few greater among them than a humble Dutch woman born in the late 19th century by the name of Corrie ten Boom. No particular thing distinguished her, born to a working middle class family. Her father was a watchmaker. She was one of four children. They grew up in a home that was devoutly committed to Christ, not just in form, but in principle, in practice, and most of all, in heart. It was a family that made up for what they might have lacked materially in the richness of their love for one another and for their community. Corey's three sisters and brothers lived in their family home with their parents and two aunts, they live comfortably in the residential quarters above her father's watchmaker shop. Corey, like any young girl, dreamed a lot of dreams. Her life didn't unfold in many ways the way that her girlish dreams had imagined. And at 50, she was single, a spinster, living with her sister and her parents in the same home above the same watchmaker's shop. She stayed home caring for her elderly aunts and mother, whom sequentially they lost over the ensuing years. She took her father's trade and became a watchmaker and jeweler. She took over the family business as her father aged into his 80s. They loved Jesus. They lived in their community. They lived a quiet life. But by the mid-1930s, everybody in Western Europe was experiencing the seismic shift that was coming out of Germany. It began with a steady influx of Jewish people from the country where they were being persecuted and harassed taught to love and serve all, especially those in need, Corey and her father and her sister hosted the deported or the refugee German Jews in their homes for Bible study, for meals, never attempting to convert or force their religious distinctions on them, merely sharing their food and their hospitality. Her heritage was a father who deeply loved Jesus and a mother who committed what herself to what in our day we might call radical hospitality, shared everything she had and made everyone feel welcome. And so it was by the late 1930s that the procession of German Jews found a safe harbor and a place of love in the Ten Boom home. It continued until 1940 when the Nazis invaded Corey's home country of the Netherlands and everything changed at that time. For the next two years, Corey and her sister and her father 
watchmakers by day, by day, increasingly by night, participated in the freedom movement, aiding the resistance, the Dutch resistance, a grassroots organization that was advocating for and helping German and increasingly Dutch Jews who were being persecuted. Corey shares in her memoir the story of smuggling ration cards, which were what were required for Netherlands Jews to eat. But the cards afforded them an unlivable amount of food. She would smuggle them at personal risk and provide them to the Jews who would come for safe harbor to their home. And so it continued until 1942 when the Nazis and the Gestapo invaded and raided the Tin Boom home. The Jews they were harboring were hidden and safe. But Corey and her sister and her elderly father were arrested after being horribly beaten. They were taken to prison and detained for five months there in the Netherlands, during which captivity her father died. In November of 1942, Corey and her sister were deported to Germany to the Ravensbrück concentration camp. What happened in those camps, the grim, dark reality of the horror of those days is well documented in history. Corey lost her sister during their internment and ultimately was released when the Nazis were defeated. That experience defined her life and forged a legacy, a legacy of defending the defenseless, helping the weak, caring for every child of God, a legacy for deprioritizing personal safety and well-being for the good of others and for the righteousness of God. Some 800 German and Dutch Jews rescuing is credited to the work of Corrie ten Boom. And she is a national and international hero. And she's a hero to me. So what does a a legacy look like? Where does a legacy like that come from? Is it just somebody who's extra good, who's specially strong with Corey Tin Boom and her like? Were they born with stars over their crib or a special dispensation of God's strength and power? At least in Corey's journey, the story has a much more granular, organic origin. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Where does a legacy begin? Our title today is Back Where It All Begins. Genesis chapter 11 is the text where we'll begin over the course of the next three weeks. We're going to follow the life of the patriarch Abraham, born Abram, and later his name is changed. This is the account, verse 27, of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran was the father of Lot, but Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Iscah were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. One day, Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, who was his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, that was his son Haran's child, and he moved away from their home, Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they got as far as Haran and stopped and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. Verse 1 of chapter 12, the Bible continues, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, 
your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. An observation with which I'd like us to begin here looking at the story of Abraham, our father of faith, a man with whose name and story the idea of legacy in the Christian tradition is perhaps most closely associated. A key observation here about Abram's origin story is that he left everything and he didn't know the plan. He left everything before the details came into focus and he had the whole picture. Try to imagine what that was like. He grew up in a a large family with extended relatives. He lost early and married only to find his wife was unable to have kids. So the family, the nucleus, home must have been all the more important. Well, at some point, his father, Tara, decided we're going to go and make a home for us elsewhere. And so uprooted Abram, Sarai, and Lot and said, we're going to go to this other land. But they made it as far as They got, and for one reason or another, the scriptures don't give us a great deal of detail. They stopped, and that was as much as Tara, his dad, had in him. And so they made that home. But it wasn't home, but it ended up being home. Tara lived 205 years, so that's long enough to feel like I'm from this place, right? I mean, after living in Colorado for 20 years, I feel like it's more home than anywhere else. And so he lived there with his kind of patched together family and recreated a a network, a home base, some strength and stability and goodness. And then his father died and God said to him, I want you to go. Imagine what that was like. The key verse here is in chapter 12 and verse one, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land I will show you. Not the land that I'm going to point out to you in great detail. Abram didn't even know where specifically he was going. Maybe he had a cardinal direction from the Lord, but it was as if to say, I'm going to start the download and it's enough to get you going and the rest will fill in in its time. In Hebrews chapter 11, the New Testament author reflects on this radical step of faithfulness, of obedience. In verse eight, it says it was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And that was how he lived out his life. Abram said yes before he knew where he was going. And scripture calls that faith. Abram considered God's promises that he would make him into a great nation and give him a land to call home. Influence, wealth, that he would establish him in that land. He considered those promises, but he did not get an actionable plan. And this can't be overstated for its significance. He didn't get a credible amount of detail. You can promise the moon, but if you don't have means of realistically fulfilling that, it's just pie in the sky. In human terms, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. And here's the important thing. Abram's yes was not to the plans. It was to the planner. And that's really the premise of this series. A legacy starts with an open-handed and an open-ended 
yes to God. A yes that doesn't extend as far as the deal has been mutually agreed, as far as the plans have disclosed. An open-handed yes that says, I'm going to trust you even if the plans as they unfold take a turn that I did not foresee and would not have chosen. A legacy starts with an open-ended yes to God. In her memoir, Corey Ten Boom writes this, the rabbi had been one of the first to vanish from our town. This was in the years between when the Nazis declared war and then invaded the Netherlands and when Corey herself was arrested. How often, she writes, it is a small, almost unconscious event that marks a turning point. As arrests of Jews in the streets became more frequent, I'd begun picking up and delivering work for our Jewish customers, myself, so they would not have to venture into the center of town. And so one evening in the early spring of 1942, I was in the home of a doctor and his wife, an old Dutch family. The Heemstras and I were talking about the things that were discussed whenever a group of people got together in those days, rationing, and the news from England, when down the stairs piped a child's voice, Daddy, you didn't tuck us in. Dr. Hemstra was on his feet in an instant. With an apology to my wife and me, he hurried upstairs, and in a minute we heard a game of hide-and-seek going in the shrill laughter of two children. That was all. Nothing changed. Mrs. Hemstra continued with her recipe for stretching the tea ration with rose leaves. And yet, somehow, everything was changed. For in that instant, reality broke through. The numbness that had grown in me since the invasion. At any minute, there might be a rap on this door. These children, this mother and this father, might be ordered to the back of a truck. Dr. Hemster came back to the living room and the conversation rambled on, but under the words, a prayer was forming in my heart. Lord Jesus, I offer myself for your people in any way, at any place, and at any time. Corey's yes preceded the events which transpired beginning in May of 1942 that would go on to darken and define her life. That spring, as their family was having dinner, there was a knock at the door. This was not uncommon for them because their home had become known as a place that would welcome and harbor Jews for dinner with love for prayer in honor of their tradition their sacrifices, and their faith. But this night, there stood at the door a single woman with one suitcase. Her story was simple. She had had her husband taken by the Gestapo. She'd been separated from her children. She was scared to go out. She had nowhere to turn, and she was told that this home housed people who would help. And so Corey was at that moment faced with a choice. She and her 82-year-old father invited the woman in and told her she could stay. Corey gave her her own bed. And there they harbored their first refugee. Well, the news spread Another, and then another, and another still. The little upstairs residence was packed with Jews fleeing the horror of Nazi oppression. Corey slept on the floor. She was 50 years old. It became apparent as homes were raided and people brutally taken away that it was just a matter of time before the word got out 
and the Gestapo were at the door. And so Corey built behind her own room a secret, separate room with a hidden door and a buzzer system. This was 1942. That should the Gestapo be sighted in the neighborhood or come to the door and a button pressed, those Jews living in the home at the time would be alerted and would run to the hiding place as it became known. And so time after time, they outfoxed the Gestapo when they would be seen in the neighborhood or in the streets or at the door, they would push the button, the buzzer would sound, the Jews would go into the secret room and knowing something must be afoot, the Gestapo would storm the house, find nothing, begrudgingly they would leave until the time came that they didn't. They never found the Jews that were hiding there that day. But convinced that something was happening and they were being made a fool of, the Gestapo took Corey and her older sister and their elderly father into custody. A custody which ended with her father and sister's death and her imprisonment in a Nazi concentration camp. I don't know whether Corey would have said yes in that moment in that Jewish family's home if she had known all that was to come, but I suspect she would have because her yes wasn't to what would transpire, but to the one who loved her, called her, and set her free. And that makes a hero to me, and that makes a legacy. In her memoir called The Hiding Place, and by the way, she is an exquisite writer. You'd love the book. She writes, faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. And it was by faith that she said yes. It was by faith Abram left home and family to go to a land that God would, at some point of his choosing, make clear how my life seems to stand in contrast. It makes me sad to remember when I came to Christ in my late teens as a college student, the premise was God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, is this true or false? It's true, certainly. Did anyone else come to Christ under the governing premise that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Well, that seemed like a decent proposition because I had come to believe in God, a God who is transcendent, more powerful than I, and capable of maneuvering the pieces on the chessboard. And so my yes was incremental. Show me the wonderful plans and I'll show you a yes. Let's see how wonderful they are and I'll see how total my yes is. But that's the way I was cultured. I don't mean to put it on society, but I was raised that it was not only allowed, but responsible to count the cost, right? We would adulterate the intent of Jesus' words to consider carefully what was being proposed. Who would sign a business contract without knowing exactly what it would cost each party and exactly how each side would benefit? I remember my yes. I remember the day I might actually have gotten saved. The day that I went back to my college dorm and kneeled at my bed and said, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore, living in limbo, waiting to calculate the risk and reward, trying to keep one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world, perpetually hedging my bets. My life is yours. Whatever comes next, whatever is in those plans, and however wonderful they prove to be, it's yes. And that's the day that, looking back, I believe my life began. We can easily reduce life with Jesus to a transaction, one that we consider on the basis of its competitive merits. Here's the thing, friends. God is not looking for a business partnership with you. 
one that advances his interests and promises it'll work out well for you as well. God's looking for your heart. It's so easy, so natural as to feel virtuous for us to say a qualified yes, contingent on the rest of the plans and how we have become focused on the plans. The very truth of God that he loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life has the potential, do you see, to become an idol. Waiting ever for the plans, we forget the planner. Evaluating the merits of the proposition, we under discover the merits of the one who proposes it. The fruit of Abraham's faith was real. It wasn't nothing. And it wasn't a side mention. God's promises were true. Abraham did indeed become a great nation of descendants. Received the promised land as home for that nation and was entrusted with, at the time, virtually unmeasurable wealth and influence. But none of this is his legacy. All of the promises of God fulfilled don't sum up his legacy. His legacy is succinctly presented in Romans chapter 4. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger and stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. It was his faith that is Abraham's legacy. Every time we talk about Abraham, we talk about faith. He is the father of of the nation, of the children of God, and he is the father of faith. He recognized that God is more than capable of fulfilling not just the promises he made, but all of his promises. And so it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called righteous. That simply means he was reconciled or made right with God. Sin having separated people from God, thus Cain, thus Adam rather, was banished from the garden in Genesis. God was still there and cared, but mankind put himself at something of a distance. And yet Abraham was brought back to right relationship with God because of his faith. This, of course, this restoration of the broken relationship, this is the heart and soul of the gospel. Abraham's legacy is the gospel. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus Christ walked the earth in human form. Abraham's legacy is the redemption of all who call on the name of the Lord and are saved. And friends, how prophetic indeed that the word we received this morning in worship is that you are not guilty. We cannot influence, earn, or achieve that verdict. Our faith and our faith alone, a galactic, preemptive, comprehensive, senseless yes to God, that is our salvation. And this morning, if you are far from God or if you've known of him but have been trying in vain to reach him, get out of the hole, get back to a buildable ground zero, dispense with the perpetual guilt, I hope this is good news. The legacy I hope for is a yes. I hope someday... After I'm gone, those who speak of me, my children, and their children after them. I hope people of faith in this city who still gather here or near this area for worship to testify to Jesus in a post-Christian city. I, God knows I'm not the best pastor. I'm not the best man. I haven't been the best father or husband. 
Jesus is making all of these things new. I hope my legacy is a guy who said yes. Because years after that time in college, God came to my wife and me and spoke to our hearts in a clear, unmistakable way. I want you to leave this place. We had just built a home on three acres where we stretched but envisioned raising our kids. A few miles down the road from a church where we had the opportunity to teach the gospel, love people, and make disciples. All seemed settled, and God said, I want you to go. A mile, an hour north is a city where all the wealth and influence in our state are hubbed, and the people of God are fleeing like the plague. Man, if I had known 2020 was coming, I think I probably would have just gone out for another coffee with a church member and called it good. What's your legacy going to be? Centuries later, the nation God promised through Abraham had descended into faithlessness, rebellion, and ultimately captivity. And in Jeremiah 29, God spoke to his pro- through his prophet to his people by way of a letter that said, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, your oppressors, I'll come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Uh, famous verse, isn't it? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Anyone know that verse? Anyone have it on a bookmark or a Bible cover? I had it on a framed picture in my bedroom as a child. I've told you this before. It featured a duck on a placid lake with little reeds poking up and in calligraphy beneath it, it said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. And that both comforted me and disturbed me. It comforted me because I believed that God was true and real, but it troubled me and it kind of laughed at me in my hyper-planned self because I would find myself thinking, God, forgive me. I'm glad you know the plans. I'd like to know the plans. It's sort of half comforting that you know the plans, but it had a little bit taken out of context and framed in mahogany, a little bit of a nanny nanny boo boo effect. I know the plans for you. You ever do that to your little brother? Well, you you care to share? But he goes on to say, I know the plans I have for you. Here's where they start. Where they end, I will show you in time along the way with your yes. But here's where they start. You will call to me and I will answer you. You will seek me and you will find me. Make no mistake about it when you seek me with all your heart. Now, no guarantees if you seek with half your heart. People do that every day. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't, but if you seek with all your heart, you will find me. And when you find me, the plans will ensue. You'll find the whole enchilada. But what I'm looking for is not your compliance. It's not your business partnership. I'm looking for your heart. I'm looking for your yes. This is where a legacy is forged. God's invitation back where it all begins is not to a function. It's to a friendship. He said, do you not think that out of stones I could raise up children for Abraham? I don't need you. I want you. I love you. It's not as though I'm bamboozled if you're not available or if you're busy doing something else. I could blink. I could snap and set everything to rights, but I value you. I dignify you. I've made you in my image and you are mine. You will call to me and I will answer you. And I love that it says he declares it with an exclamation point. He doesn't say, hey, I'll be found by you. He says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. As for you, Israel, my servant, Isaiah, the prophet records, Jacob, my chosen one, descended from Abraham, my friend. Wow. What a legacy is that? 
Can you imagine? Centuries later, years later, people are talking about great grandpa JD and they're like, as for you children descended from JD, my friend. It's the legacy I want. I love how his story unfolds in Genesis 15 and we'll wrap it up here. The word of the Lord came to Abraham later. This is when he calls him Abraham. He changes his name in this story. He says, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. He reminds him of the promises. He reinstates the vision. But he says, the descendants, the great nation, that's not the reward. The land, that's not the reward. The wealth, the fame, the influence, none of that is the reward. I am the reward. And so Abraham is known as God's friend. Our series is legacy, living on purpose. And it's a bit of an irony, really, if you think about it, because a righteous legacy does not come from a life of pursuing purpose. We're good at pursuing purpose. We have seminars and we get weeks off of work to go get trained on being purpose driven. And that's valuable. But a life of legacy doesn't flow from that. Rather, purpose itself flows from a life that says yes to God. Purpose flows from that yes. God asked Abraham to leave his home and his family, and he said yes. He said yes to God. God asked Corey Ten Boom, will you see people and care for them? And she said, yes. Scarcely knowing what that would look like and what it would cost her. So, what is God asking you? What's the question? Many times at the end of services, I or another pastor will ask a question and ask us to reflect on the answer. I want to know what the question is. What is God asking of you that might result in a legacy forging yes? Here's what we're going to do. The worship team is going to rejoin me here and we're going to take a moment to pray and reflect on that question. You'll see in the back on our wailing wall, our sometime wailing wall, the banner says legacy with a couple of tables of scraps of paper and some masking tape and some number two pencils. It's also in process, isn't it? It's also unfinished. It's also along the way. We're going to take some time and in the atmosphere of worship, invite you to reflect. And then I'd like to ask as a focus for this month, for your prayers and for what God would do in your life, would you go back there to the table, grab one of the scraps of paper and a pencil and write that question? Maybe you're, maybe you're not ready to answer it yet. But as you discern, what's the question God's asking you? Would you write it and then just take some of the masking tape, stick it right on the wall. And that'll be our wailing wall. That'll be our wall of faith this month, reminding us that God is far from finished. And even now, even at 50 years old, sad and in the world's eyes, forlorn, unmarried, living in her parents' home, running a humble watch, business. God asked, and one woman said yes, and helped change reality. Even now, says the Lord. That's how the scripture words it. Even now, if I call to you today, starting right here, don't harden your heart. Your yes starts now. Maybe you're long since answered. What was the question? 
And what might, might God be asking you anew? Can you stand with me? We'll pray, worship, and then I'll invite you. A couple people just gonna need to break the ice. In fact, let's just go ahead and pre-break the ice. Can we do that? Who's gonna go back there first? Like one or two people, come on, just raise your hand. We're gonna hold you to it. We'll shame you if you don't. All right, I can't see who you are. I still can't see you, but thank you. All right, thank you. Just follow, make your way. Lord, in Jesus' name, there's no power in a scrap of paper and a number two pencil. There is power in your promises and there is power in faith. So Lord, would you give us grace to hear your voice this morning? Let's quiet your heart for a minute. Invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear what you're asking of us. And give us faith to say yes and forge a legacy in Jesus' name.